graduate from this program that uh, has, been, has been a leading program in the world, uh, Raz Dupree. I, I don't have to tell you many things about him because all of you, the, the audience here knows very well what he has accomplished and his recognitions, um, uh, a recipient of the National Medal of Technology, a member of the National Academy of Engineering. The list goes on, tells you about how significant his contributions have been. The only thing I will tell you is that uh, all three degrees were from the University of Illinois. That means that's where he was inspired, that's where he was trained, and that's where he was launched for an amazing career that took him uh, to Austin and now at Georgia Tech, leading one of the most distinguished uh, centers for uh, uh, 3.5 nano and opto nano, oh my, opto electronic technology. Oh. So uh, without any further ado, please uh, help me welcome Raj Dupree. Greek amulet here. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm going to start with Yogi Berra quote too. It's deja vu all over again, <laughs> because what what we're going to talk about in this presentation is something that Nick started a long time ago in 1960, when, in spite of the pundits who believe that alloy semiconductors were trash and not worth working on. Nick, who was trained uh, by his upbringing in, in Southern Illinois and by his training here in Illinois and his work with John, to just go out and do it. Get your ass in the lab and do it. And so this is a, another one of the success stories that surrounds Nick and John Bardeen too. The development of compound semiconductors beyond the binaries which today are on the underpinnings of every device you're going to meet on the street or anywhere else, maybe short of whatever the Klingons are doing, which we don't really understand. So I'm going to talk about how we can use the transistor and all of that wonderful technology that John and Bratton brought to us, understanding of holes, and the understanding Nick brought to us about how to make a semiconductor do our bidding instead of uh, what Mother Nature sort of created in the simple form. These are truly man-made materials and they bring to fore the uh, intellectual well, contributions of Nick uh, across many, many different now semiconductor platforms. This is just one of them. It's, it's again deja vu all over again because this is not a new semiconductor. Gallium nitride was known to be a semiconductor a long time ago, since at least the 60s. Uh, the first nitride laser was optically pumped, but it was demonstrated in 1971. So it's been a long time. This is, this is again nothing too dramatically new. I'm going to try to talk today about uh, how it applies to a uh, relatively new application area, that is three five nitride optoelectronics, and many of you are familiar with this uh, spectrum diagram here. Is there a laser pointer in this thing? Alright. So, you're familiar with this because the sun, which is our current primary source of energy on the planet uh, has this beautiful spectrum that arrives here through the atmosphere and our eyes are developed to respond to it over billions of years. But there are other regions up in this ultraviolet range where there's very useful kinds of optoelectronics that can be done. I'm going to, and of course down here in the infrared as well, I'm going to focus on the visible part primarily in this talk because it's uh, extremely important in our current economy and of course Nick had the right idea again a long time ago find something that humans can see and you're going to have a success. So we're going to look at photons that humans can see and we're going to go up here a little bit and talk about ultraviolet because in the ultraviolet spectrum uh, beyond what the sun delivers to us which is all absorbed by the atmosphere there are some opportunities for communications. <coughs> You're all familiar with the light emitting diode. It's become the sort of 
uh, standard product for all of us to use for trap signals for Amish buggy lights, uh, <laughs> for lighting various architectural features like this hotel, uh, camera flashes that are being developed, LCD displays that are backlit with LEDs and televisions, uh, more exotic cars like this one use it as a headlight and uh, well I wish uh, mine's back there actually <laughs> um, and and illuminating houses this small house is in England somewhere in London I think uh, this is Buckingham Palace and it's lit now externally with LEDs for a cost of about two dollars per night in terms of energy and this was done by Philips Illumileds so even the Queen of England knows how to save money. You may have heard that her, her budget is being slashed and she's got to sort of scrape by. Uh, so this was an important advantage to her to save money lighting up her house. Uh, we're going to all and eventually have a lot of these in our, in our houses. And one forecast that I've read projects that market growth for light emitting diodes in general, especially high brightness, will be about 30% per year, reaching about $19 billion in 2014. Uh, Nick mentioned an anniversary, and there's another one uh, coming up in 2012. It will be the 50th anniversary of the first visible uh, laser that Nick made and the first visible light emitting diode. So these are 50-year kind of technology developments, but it's going to, in the next 50 years, there will be a remarkable change in how we use energy to create light and derived from what Nick started in alloys and in the first visible light emitting diodes. The compound average growth rate, 60% or so uh, in signs and displays. LED TV sales, for example, are expected to move to 32 million units in this year. 19% of all, all uh, TVs will be LED TVs. And illumination, has the next highest growth rate beyond the signs and displays of about 45%. And these are some typical uh, commercially available LEDs today. They're, they're 60 watt replacements. They consume from 10 to 12 watts of energy. So we'll start seeing these. Uh, this is a Creed product. These two are Philips. Lumileds, they'll start making an impact in your home soon. Uh, another application that's coming to the fore are laser TVs. This is a picture from a Mitsubishi 65 inch rear projection laser TV. Uh, they have an important advantage in power. One third of the operating power consumption of similarly sized LCD TVs and one fourth that of plasmas. And they also have 3D ready technology. So it's probably true that sooner or later we'll be seeing these kind of things in, uh, in many applications in your home. They're currently priced around $5,000 depending on where you shop on the web. And uh, so they're actually very accessible to uh, people. This is the projected market growth for uh, various kinds of LEDs, the standard ones, indicators uh, like on your computers, high brightness ones, and then the ultra high brightness ones. And these are the ones that are coming into play in general illumination and in vehicles for headlights and so forth. So you can see there's going to be a dramatic uh, change and expansion of the high brightness LED. All these are based on gallium nitride as I'll describe here in the next few minutes. This is the global market share up to 2016 for solid state lighting, incandescent and fluorescence. As you see the fluorescent market is going to plateau and of course what's going to bear the brunt of the LED impact is the incandescent bulb which has been banned by many states in many countries. By 2012, there will be no standard light bulbs sold in California or New Zealand and various other countries. So this will start becoming dominant. Eventually, this will go away. There won't be any fluorescent lighting anywhere in the world. What allows us to do this is this unique band gap versus lattice constant diagram I show you here for the nitrides. These are the wurtzite crystalline structure forms. And as you can see, they go from somewhere around germanium band gap of 0.7 EV up to the deep UV uh, 6.2 EV. This photon energy is around that that people are planning to use for deep UV lithography. It's 210 nanometers. And the alloy system, 
uh, again, covers things around the visible. In fact, there are two alloys that cover that visible range. And then up here in the ultraviolet, uh, there's a solar blind regime, which is described by the fact that photons with wavelengths shorter than 280 nanometers don't reach the Earth's surface uh, because of atmospheric absorption. So this, this generation of photons is called solar blind emission. And these are visible blind uh, photons. <clears throat> so what we're exploring here in this system, which allows us to make these wonderful devices in the visible, is a ternary alloy, a basically a clone of what Nick did in 1960. And while it's somewhat different in detail, again, the principle is deja vu all over again. This alloy system, aluminum gallium nitrate, is also important for uh, these deep UV photons. And Dr. Shen will be describing some other types of devices that rely on these kinds of alloys as well. What I'm going to explore today is uh, things that are sort of lattice matched to gallium nitride, which uh, include uh, some alloys of indium aluminum nitride up here. Uh, as you can see, the binary aluminum nitride is not lattice matched to any of these materials. So having high quality gallium nitride substrates opens up a, a window of opportunity for us to use those substrates to develop radically new important devices. But there's also a technology we're working on to use aluminum nitride, which has a boron alloy uh, added to aluminum nitride. So again, a ternary alloy, again, following along Nick's footsteps. Uh, so I'll focus on, on two alloys, this aluminum gallium nitride alloy this is a commonly used composition for FETs. It's strained in uh, crystalline form to gallium nitride. And then there's another alloy. We'll talk about this indium aluminum nitride alloy, which is lattice matched to gallium nitride. This is an alloy that we're exploring in my group for a variety of applications. There's also an interesting way to make LEDs that have indium gallium nitride uh, alloys in the green, for example, here, band gap in the green, and lattice matched a larger band gap aluminum indium nitride or indium aluminum nitride barriers for quantum wells. So this is another area we're exploring. Uh, what I want to talk about is how to grow this material. This is a very difficult material to grow because indium nitride has a very weak bond between indium and nitrogen. Aluminum and nitrogen have a very strong bond. And so we like to grow aluminum nitride at a high temperature and indium nitride at low temperatures. And that's a problem. Another problem that occurs in this system, as you saw, the lattice parameters are quite distinctly different. And they're highly polarized along the C-axis, which is the normal axis we grow on, because the gallium and nitrogen have a high polarity difference. And I, here are some simple band diagrams of what we typically draw for a quantum well, as you, Nick, alluded to in 1977 in this campus is where the first quantum well lasers were made. And these are the kind of band diagrams that we were drawing at the time. With the piezoelectric effects and the electric field built into these quantum wells, in the nitride case, we have this sort of operation going on, which has a lot of problems in maintaining uh, wavelength uniformity and wavelength quality as you drive these devices harder. Uh, another effect that occurs, partly because of this, is if you look at the peak lumens for a 50% duty cycle, uh, operation of LED versus diode current, you see that uh, the, the light intensity increases, but the wall plug efficiency over here on this other axis decreases dramatically. This is commonly referred to as droop. And there are several approaches to studying droop, which have been published, and trying to understand what causes this, because it doesn't occur in other types of semiconductor LEDs. And one of the problems is probably carrier spillover due to inefficient electron blocking, partly because of these piezoelectric fields. Auger recombination because these carriers are in a very high density in these quantum wells and tend to be localized in these very uh, small regions within the quantum wells. Hole transport, holes don't move very far. This is another example of Dr. Bardeen's uh, innovations and uh, his work is the holes matter. And holes matter as much as electrons. And moving holes is a big job in some materials. It's a big job in this system. Of course, defects. Defects in this material 
are unfortunately present in high concentrations in most LEDs, 10 to the 9 or more, and so we have to worry about what effects those have. Uh, hot carrier effects, again, high plasma carrier temperatures, high level injection, and high energy injection into the quantum wells, exciton dissociation, and parasitic tunneling. So a whole nest of problems uh, occur at high current densities where high brightness LEDs are being made today. Uh, this slide shows you a typical LED structure that we're developing in my group. It's, it's fairly standard uh, within the industry. Uh, we start with a Z-plane sapphire, uh, a gallium nitride low temperature buffer layer, high temperature buffer layer, high temperature in this case around 1100 degrees centigrade, much higher than gallium arsenide, uh, heavily doped, silicon doped, N plus gallium nitride, end layer, and then comes the quantum wells here in green. But before we grow the quantum wells, we have to prepare the surface because of the strain. So typically we might use uh, a small amount of indium in this region, or, or maybe not. Uh, gallium nitride barriers and in-gan quantum wells. This is the so-called electron blocking layer, which is a large band gap material on the P side to block electrons which are injected. Uh, essentially the same thing you would you would have in a transistor, of course, electrons injected into the P layer and, and the holes injected in the N layer. In this case, we have no base because we're not making a contact to this region, but we have electrons overshooting the quantum wells and recombining in the P layer where we don't want them to recombine. So we have an electron blocking layer. This is the P side of the device. Again, uh, PN junction based device. So. Uh, P-type gallium nitride or in gallium nitride. Uh, this is a TEM micrograph of the quantum well active region, and as Nick said, we're not dealing with nano nonsense. We're dealing with angstroms here, angstroms of individual atomic layers, and you can see them in this TEM micrograph. These are individual atomic layers of gallium nitride and individual atomic layers of indium gallium nitride. They're, uh, as you can see, this this says 8C. That means it's eight lattice parameters thick. Uh, and it's about four nanometers in total thickness. What we're trying to study in my group is this blocking layer because it is it can be grown as I showed you lattice matched to gallium nitride, which means most of the structure is lattice matched, and it has a higher energy gap than the conventional aluminum gallium nitride form. So we focus a lot of our work on this active layer, of course, developing that. Uh, we look a lot at the P side, trying to develop that. Uh, an important factor is the use of this new electron blocking layer, and of course an underlayer because there's a lot of strain in this system, and of course the substrate matters. So uh, besides C-plane sapphire, we have C-plane gallium nitride, which is much lower dislocation density, and then some other orientations besides C-plane, which are less polar than the C-axis. I want to also point out that the issue of nitride polarity is not new. And in fact, Shun Lin Chong here in 1999 published a paper, as far as I'm one of the first, to show a calculation with polarization variation with orientation in nitrides. So what about this indium aluminum nitride? Well, I showed you this uh, energy gap diagram before uh, and the fact that we can grow a lattice-matched uh, structure using this alloy. And this shows how we can change the, comp the strain in that alloy system relative to gallium nitride by ch changing the alloy composition. Again, a an important feature that Nick showed us in 1960 and 62 especially is that alloys can be tailored to your bidding and binary semiconductors you're sort of stuck with. So having Nick's innovation at hand gives us a, a whole new tool set to deal with problems of materials and design of laser diodes and LEDs. So this lattice matched gallium nitride material, if you choose about 18% or somewhere in this region, you get a, an alloy here with a large band gap lattice matched to gallium nitride and that allows us to design LEDs that are much more efficient than similar structures with aluminum gallium nitride. I alluded to this earlier. This stuff is tough to grow, and, and uh, I can't 
speak personally for Nick's first efforts to make gallium arsenide phosphide, but I know things blew up occasionally in his, in his ampules. Uh, we don't have that happening, fortunately. Things aren't blowing up on us. But uh, the material blows up in the reactor, if you will, if you try to make this, because indium nitride likes to grow around 600 degrees centigrade, and aluminum nitride likes to grow at 1300, and we're trying to make a marriage here between some rather serious uh, material systems that are widely differing in what they prefer. Furthermore, phase separation can occur. So my students have been working on this for a little while, trying to develop these alloys, and also want to push out, as I said, in this other range where about 50% of the alloy is indium. That's even going to be harder to do. So we'll focus on this uh, lattice matched alloy here, about 18% aluminum. Uh, here's that diagram again. And this shows you, a, again, a TM micrograph, somewhat lower magnification of the same kind of LED I showed you earlier with quantum wells. This layer here, however, now is an indium aluminum nitride electron blocking layer. So instead of aluminum gallium nitride. Uh, these are simulated band diagrams at zero bias for two types of quantum wet LEDs. The, the, the red curve here is aluminum gallium nitride electron blocking layer, standard structure. The black curve is the indium aluminum nitride electron blocking layer. You, you notice these very seriously uh, peaked uh, quantum well structures. These are due to the piezoelectric fields and polarization fields in these structures. A high, a large electric field in megavolts per centimeter in these quantum wells. Uh, the black curve shows you the advantage of this alloy lattice match to gallium nitride in terms of electron blocking layer. Remember, electrons are coming from this side and being injected into the quantum wells, and we need a big energy barrier to keep them from going into the p layer. Of course, this is zero bias, so you would really want to look at this at five to six volts or 10 volts of forward bias. But you can see the advantage there is in, in this additional energy barrier. Interestingly, there's a hole barrier. And as Nick pointed out, uh, holes matter. And so we've got to try to engineer that. And that's sort of what we're up to now is trying to in innovate and engineer that, that material so we can get a better hole transport. This is a comparison of LEDs like this, green LEDs or green emitters, uh, they, they emit in the 530, 540 uh, range of the spectrum uh, using this lattice matched EBL. And a comparison here of two different kinds of EBLs, one growing at high temperature, one at low temperature. This is a detailed growth condition uh, and growth time. And we found that we can optimize this by changing the growth temperature and growth pressure and the growth rate. So these are the kinds of knobs we have to make Mother Nature do our bidding. Uh, here again is TM micrograph of these LEDs uh, showing the quantum wells and the electron blocking layer at somewhat higher magnification. This is a dislocation derived from the fact this is grown in sapphire. So it's one of those defects that we can get rid of if we use different substrates, but which are always present in sapphire-based growth. Again, we're growing quantum wells at about uh, four lattice parameters thick. Barrier is about 21 lattice parameters thick, so it's about 25 angstroms, or if you're if you're in the nanometer game, 2.5 nanometers. Uh, these are really some of the first published results I know of. Uh, uh, what we often find is that industry doesn't tell us their secrets, and so I, I'm not sure if there are other LEDs on the planet like this or not, but ours are, are show an, a dramatic improvement. What we have here are uh, LEDs made by my team at, L, at uh, Georgia Tech, and EL intensity versus wavelength for different current densities. And what we see here is going from 60 milliamps to 420 milliamps. And this is a standard LED quant green quantum well. Actually, this is a blue quantum well, about 450 or 460 nanometers, uh, without any electron blocking layer. If we put in the standard algan electron blocking layer, we get dramatic improvement. And this is the, the preferred ternary right now, indium aluminum nitride, 18%. You can see a, a dramatic improvement of the output light. And if you look at this versus a high current density injection, this is light output power versus injection current uh, under pulse mode. Uh, this is the LED without the electron blocking. This is the droop effect I alluded to. This is the LED with the aluminum gallium nitride EBL, the standard published LED structure that everyone talks about. And this is the one that we've been developing with indium aluminum nitride. 
this is quantum efficiency versus current density. You can see we're running about 350 amps per square centimeter, which is quite high for an LED. Not, not for a laser diode, of course, but for an LED. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the black curve here, which is the LED without the EBL, has a very high quantum efficiency at low current densities, which, it, well, it doesn't matter, does it? Because no one wants to turn their light bulb on and not see anything. But uh, very low current densities give you low light output. However, when you run this to turn your lights on, uh, an LED in a white light bulb, about 60 watt replacement, is going to run about this current density, only it's going to be a much bigger chip. Uh, you can see this dramatic reduction in quantum efficiency. The green curve here is this aluminum gallium nitride based EBL LED uh, improvement at high current densities, but still a lot of droop. And this is the, the ternary lattice matched in the aluminum nitride LED, much reduced droop, much higher output at all current densities compared to the standard ALGAN LED. So we think this is an important innovation to reduce droop and therefore to improve the performance of high current density light emitting diodes for all applications including white LEDs. Let me move forward to the laser diode. As I showed you earlier there is a laser TV on the market. It uses uh, semiconductor lasers mostly. But the green laser is not a semiconductor laser. In true form, it's actually a triple laser. Uh, starts with a semiconductor laser, but it's not a green laser. So what would it take to make a true laser display? The kind of thing that would go on your iPhone 5. So when you display those pictures you took of your, uh, what can I say, dog, let's say, uh, <coughs> you would see a full color display that could fill the screen from your iPhone. Of course, you probably should plug into the wall first because your battery won't last long. So eventually, batteries are the bane of our existence, as you know. And, uh, but anyhow, let, let's move forward to how a laser diode would be structured. Currently, this is sort of a current version of a laser diode, and uh, it has the same kind of structure, only now it has waveguides, optical waveguides. And they're made of super lattices. Uh, you can see a TM micrograph here of one of our laser diodes. You can faintly see the super lattice. And again, this is 2.5 nanometers per layer. There's a couple hundred of them there. So anyone who thinks that we're not doing nanotechnology is sort of off the mark. Uh, we're actually controlling the semiconductor down to a few lattice parameters when we're making these layers. This is a, a, a gallium nitride waveguide, an in-GAN waveguide. These are the quantum wells another waveguide part, and another waveguide part, and there's another super lattice up here. This is shown in the structure. Uh, Shen's team, working with my group, has made lasers that look like this in, in a top-down view of the process device, and they look like this when you look at the far field pattern of a 4-6 nanometer emitting laser diode. So many of you know in your Blu-ray players, their lasers are running at 409 nanometers. They're, they're basically purple or nearly invisible, actually. They're UV. Uh, what would you use a blue laser for? Well, obviously laser TV. You need a green laser, a blue laser, and a red laser. And so this is one of the things that are being pushed forward uh, in many of the industry, unfortunately mostly in Japan and Korea, where all the color TVs are made, by LG, Samsung, and Sony, uh, and Mitsubishi. So uh, we'd like to bring this into the green, and this next transition in the green is going to require that other innovation I showed you, the indium aluminum gallium nitride electron blocking layer. So we've pushed this uh, as far as we can take it into the green. The records now for these kinds of structures are, are in the green, but the industrial people who are reporting them don't tell you what they're growing. They don't give you any secrets. They don't give you even the structure they're growing. I'm sure they're growing indium aluminum nitride electron blocking layer. This is uh, some optical power versus current density from Shen's group uh, using some of our material. We, we were working with the standard aluminum gallium nitride EBLs. This is a laser threshold here. You can see about, about 4.6 kiloamps per square centimeter. These are the kind of numbers that Milton's seeing in his, in his transistors when Nick said, oh my gosh, you got laser kind of thresholds in those devices. You see any light? Milton says, duh, light. And so fortunately, they went and looked for it and they found it. If we use a different kind of EBL, this is an innovation we, we developed at Georgia Tech, using a graded aluminum gallium nitride EBL, we get even lower 
threshold current densities. And unfortunately, this is one of the vagaries of working at a university. We're highly dependent on outside funding. And so when you want to make the next step, you've got to find someone who's got some deep pockets to pay your students to do this. And we're still working on that. But basically, we want to take this innovation and make a green laser diode uh, for the color TV application. There's also a, a few people who understand that seawater has a transmission window about 550 nanometers. So if you want to optic, optically communicate in a surreptitious and secure way underwater, you might use a green laser to talk to your porpoises and other trained people uh, under the water. Let me talk now about the solar blind region. This is a, a, a plot of the irradiance from the sun in uh, these strange units. Uh, versus wavelength, and you see it's fairly flat here, in, it's fairly flat and divisible too, until you get to about 290 nanometers when everything shuts off. This is about five orders of magnitude reduction in photon flux from the sun, and it's not because the sun isn't effective in the UV, it's because the, the atmosphere absorbs it all. So any photon you see from this kind of region above 290 is not from the sun, it's from something else, uh, either a fire or something else. So detecting photons up in here could be interesting. It would be also interesting to be able to communicate optically in this region. Um, it's called solar blind because if you're in some environment where you want to communicate, again, sort of in a secure way, you don't want people to be able to find where you are. And that's one of the things with radio transmissions. You might find where the person is. Uh, and you want to communicate with many people who you don't know where they are, so you can't just point a laser at them. In fact, buildings or trees may block them. So if you use UV light, it scatters in the atmosphere so effectively that if you were somewhere within a few clicks, a few kilometers of the source, you could get a signal. And no one would know you're there, and no one would know where the source is. So Department of Defense folks like to think about those kind of things. And so they want to make lasers in the intrinsic solar blind region. DARPA just has a BAA coming out for UV lasers in the fantastic wavelength range of 220 to 250 nanometers. And I remind you that aluminum nitride has a band gap around 210 nanometers. So that's going to take a lot of this kind of stuff, or maybe indium aluminum nitride. Once you have a laser, which no one has at this point, uh, you have to detect the light. So we had a program to make detectors, and Dr. Shen's team worked with ours to develop these detectors. Here's a, a schematic structure again. The hole matters, and we have a PN junction, actually a PIN junction, N side, P side with a multiplication region here. Uh, and this is the current density versus reverse bias for these APDs in the dark and under UV illumination at 430 nanometers. And the optical gain is calculated here. What you see here is a blow up of this region around the avalanche. Uh, this data was the first in the known universe to show a high performance gallium nitride avalanche detectors with gains above 10 to the fifth. Uh, we're all also working on this to do single photon counting, which is another development we have to can work on the materials to do. So these initial APDs offer promise uh, for UV up electronics. Again, UV sources, UV detectors can be used in communication systems. Uh, we want to extend this gallium nitride work we've done to the aluminum gallium nitride or a wider band gap intrinsically solar blind region. Uh, typically, this requires high composition of algan, maybe 70% aluminum. Very difficult to grow. Uh, we're learning, but it's still difficult. And we need better substrates. UV compatible aluminum nitride substrates are available. Uh, they're not yet UV transparent, unfortunately. We have to manage strain and we have to manage dislocations and all this other business. So, let me summarize say that, uh, again, it's deja vu all over again. Alloys. Uh, are what we need to make these devices. The whole matters, the transistor demonstration. And by the way, I'm a transistor baby. I was born in 1947. I was all of five months old when that happened, but I must have appreciated it when it happened. Uh, of course, it wasn't announced until 1948, so I was nearly a year old when it was announced. So I, I didn't read the paper, unfortunately, at that time. Um, so, but anyhow, we. We're, we're fortunate that Nick and others led us into this field and led us through some of the dark days where uh, no one quite understood what a laser was, a semiconductor laser. And, and as I said, it'll be 50 years 
in 2012. We understood finally what a, what a semiconductor laser was. Uh, we're still dealing with materials issues, and Nick has always been uh, very vocal about you got to get the materials right or you got basically nothing to talk about. And, you, know, you can talk about all the ideas you have, but if you can't make them, you're, you're going to get nowhere. You're not going to make any products, you're not going to make any jobs, you're not going to make any money. So in spite of these challenges of the three nitrides, which I tried to describe, uh, LEDs, laser diodes, and FETs, Shen will talk about HBTs. We have, I think, the world's best HBTs in the gallium nitride regime, so he's, he's trying to catch up to Milton and, and in a different material system. Uh, and by the way, Milton's group worked with my group a long time ago to make the first nitride laser, uh, sorry, light emitting transistors in the nitride. So they were blue emitters, quite pretty. Uh, these devices need a lot of work. And fortunately, we have some smart grad students. I hope that can come along. And if we can find some money, we can get that job done. A lot of these things boil down to, to materials. And these materials are difficult. They're, they're the kind of things that keep you awake at night saying, what the heck is going on? Uh, and they keep you awake at night saying, how am I going to pay for this? Because a, a two inch diameter gallium nitride substrate is $8,000. And that's a poor one. Uh, the Pol it turns out the Polish uh, group in Poland has made the world's best gallium nitride substrates, two inch diameter. I tried to buy some from them. And we had to go through rather a long email back and forth. Finally, they sent me uh, an NDA to sign. And the NDA included the fact that they own all the IP for anything we grow on their substrates. <laughs> and they own everything we grow on their substrates in terms of reviewing it before publication. And by the way, the sale is covered by the laws of Poland. Needless to say, the Georgia Tech wouldn't sign such an NDA. And so I haven't seen their material ever. But uh, it's, it's just a, recently a cover article on uh, on uh, an important journal that I hope you see in Spectrum. Spectrum. Yeah. So uh, it's not the world's most important semiconductor development, even though it's portrayed that. The first most important, I think, you could probably say is the transistor. And in my view, the second most important would be the visible laser diode. But I'm biased, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> thanks, Nick, for everything. Thanks. Thank you very much for leading us. And that it's a diode that became a laser. Uh, of course. Well, laser. Yeah. And a transistor <laughs> became a laser. Okay. I mean, it, it's. So it's you could say diode laser. Maybe no, that no, sequence no. would be more it, it, it's mathematically correct or historically correct. It's not a laser CO2. It's a CO2 laser. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll rewrite history here, too. Uh, it's going to be hard slog, but and, and you see, anyhow, LED, LED is stuck in the world. We're not going to change it. Well, LED is a light emitting. It's a diode that's a light emitter. Yeah. It's a light emitting diode. Yeah. Right? So, and, but, but it's not right for you to say LDs. It's not an LD. It's not a laser diode. No, okay. okay. What parts are you working on? It's a small matter. It's much more important than what you're talking about, about the crystals. And, and obviously the crystal is a big deal. And uh, 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 you recognize how big the materials component was of the work. Now when I look at what the so-called material scientists do, they come into the field after we already know more than they know about all this. And, and uh, in other words, they, don't, they haven't added much to this. It's the device builders who had the, the guts and the motivation to go attack, attack, attack to make the, the thing that has to be made. That's, what the success is of what Milton's doing. He's, he knows he has to make the electronics. 